Hello class, welcome to lecture 17, sequel part two. Let's rock. Here's the plan of attack for today. I'm gonna to start with a bit of housekeeping. I'll do a quick review from last time. I don't expect you to answer, but you can. I'm not spying on you, so I won't be able to hear you, but you get my drift. We'll spend most of the day building on what we discussed before with SQL part one, write a bunch of queries, and Suppose you can meet with your teams if you like, but um, I'm not going to force the issue. Housekeeping and upcoming schedule. Um, next class, we're going to do a midterm review session. I would definitely suggest showing up for that one. And then after that, you got it. You've got the midterm. Let's do a quick review from last time. What is arguably the most important command in SQL? The answer is the select statement. And what other commands can you use to write statements? There are a bunch, including update and delete. You can make different tables. You can append records to different tables. Um, but in this class, we are only going to cover the select statement. Remember, select allows you to pull data from a database table, or if you do a join, multiple tables. Um, if you take CIS365 with my friend, Professor Moser, then you will understand much more about what you can do beyond pulling records from existing tables. You can use, for instance, the create command to create an entirely new table. And really the world is your oyster, but the intent of this section of the course is to provide you with an overview of what SQL can do and some basic SQL writing skills. Okay. Remember, this is our template. We are going to select column names from a table. Right. Remember here that the syntax is very important. If you get it wrong, it won't work. For instance, if you put in the word choose, column names, SQL doesn't understand the word choose. It understands the word select. It's also important if you wanted to restrict the result set. You can put in a where condition. Um, but again, the formatting here is particularly important. If you were to put in, in some cases, an extra space or a period instead of a comma, it's not going to work. Remember, we also talked about ORs, right? Booleans, right? These are different operands. Um, you've got here select column name or names or field names from a table, and you can use WHERE conditions. So let's say I want to find all the Marillion albums from 1985 or all the Marillion albums from 1995, right? That would return, in theory, more. Ands are more exclusive, right? So you can certainly write a column, right? Select data or select distinct data. Remember, you may get multiple records. If Marillion in this example had put out multiple records in 2007, um, we may only want to see uh, the release date um, as opposed to everything about them. So select distinct lets you pull in only the distinct records from the set. And if you've got an and here for the condition, then that could be exclusive. For instance, if I wanted to restrict my query to records that meet several conditions, then I may pull fewer records than if I had an or condition. For instance, if I wanted to pull all Marillion records that started with an F and started with an N, I would get nothing because clearly a record can only start with one letter of the alphabet. Okay. Um, it is generally good practice to use a semicolon at the end of a statement. You're certainly going to see this in Python. Um, sometimes the different tools you can use to write SQL are more or less picky about them. Again, we're using the Northwind database running off of MySQL on Amazon Web Services, but as someone who's written more SQL statements than he can count, I'm talking about thousands over the course of his career, um, it really does depend on the tool. You didn't think that I'd forget about the quote of the day, did you? The power to question is the basis of all human progress from Indira Gandhi. Remember, at a high level, structured query language allows you to ask questions. A query is just another word for a question, right? How many records are in a data set on Marillion, how many customers have purchased from us in the last six months, how many employees haven't received paychecks from us in the Eastern Division over the last two weeks. 
Those are all business questions that we can ask and answer when we've got SQL. So without any further ado, let's get to the new material. Okay. First up, you may want to sort your data, right? You've got it in a format that makes sense, but you want to sort it by date or by last name or by customer location. Okay. Can you do that in SQL? No, not at all. I'm just mentioning it. Of course you can. In fact, you can sort by more than one field, but we don't call it sorting in SQL world. Remember the syntax is precise. You have to call it order by. So in our template here, we would still select fields or columns from table names, but now we can use order by, right? What would this look like? Well, let me give you a few examples. I'm going to switch over here to SQL. And I'm going to write, let's make this a little bit bigger, a few SQL statements here. There we go. All right, All right so I'm going to do SQL. And, right? So I am selecting from the employee table title, last name, first name, and employee ID, and I'm sorting it by employee ID descending. And there you go. Right, I've got here employee ID 987654321, right? Now let's see what happens if I move the word descending here, right? It sorts, but in alpha order. So by default, when you sort or order in SQL, it is ascending, but if you want to make it descending, again, you can just go back here, hit descending, and there you go. Okay, so it's pulling from the employee table this information, but it's sorting by employee ID. And if I wanted, I could easily switch that to title, descending, right, query, in which case, V, S, S, et cetera, et cetera, I would go here. Again, if I were to remove that, boom, we've got here it sorted by ascending order. Okay, let's take a look at another example. This is going to pull from the customer table again, just customer ID and company name. Again, this is a very different query. If I want, I could have used one of these windows here, but I chose not to. And again, this orders by company name, okay? And if I wanted to see other fields in the customer table, I could easily then add um, address. Right? Now I can also sort if I wanted by address, but this probably isn't going to make a difference because we've only got one customer ID field and we really should. Remember when we talked about cardinality, one to many. If I've got three records for AT&T, that's going to mess things up. I'll just leave it at that for right now. So that's a little bit here on ordering or sorting data. So let's go back to our template, right? And we're going to insert a where condition, right? sorting by ascending or descending. Right now here we're going to get select we're going to use select distinct. Okay? Let's go back to our template here. And actually let's hold off on that one for a moment. So let's take a look at our modified template. If we want, we can use select distinct from table name where a condition exists and we can order it. So let's see that one in action. Uh, select distinct makes sense if you've got a lot of records and you just wanna see a unique number. Uh, for instance, let's take a look at our customer table. If I do a select, whoops, from let's say customers, and here's a trick here. I run this query, I see that I get 91 records. So we've got 91 different customers, right? If I were to change that to select distinct, I'm still going to get 91 customers, right? That makes sense because they're all unique. So that in that case, it doesn't make any difference. But what about orders? Right? How many customers do we have in the order table? Right? If I go to the order table here, I can see that I've got 830 records. So if I did a select all from 
customers. Still gonna get, <laughs> coffee hasn't kicked in. Orders. Wow, my coffee really hasn't kicked in yet. From orders, boom, I'm going to see 830 records. Now, how are they all distinct? Well, they're all distinct because I've got fields here that make them all distinct. So instead of selecting all, actually, I've got here, again, 830 records because they're all distinct. But what if instead of all, I switch that to customer ID. You see here how now I have only 89 customers. Okay, so of those 830 orders, they have come from 89 customers. But remember, we select distinct from customers, we've got 91 records, which means that there are two customers who have not placed orders. All right, I'm going to come back later and explain to you how you can find out which one. Let's talk for a minute about joins. Can you join more than one table in a query? Well, think about it. If remember on the other day, we talked about normalization and putting things in different tables because it made more sense. It's going to be easier to maintain. Um, it's certainly going to be faster in terms of system performance. SQL really wouldn't be very powerful if I could only ask very limited questions. In fact, in my career, Sometimes I've had to join seven or eight different tables on a query. We're not going to do anything that sophisticated here, but I do want to introduce this notion of a join statement. With a join statement, you absolutely can pull tables from records from multiple tables. At a high level, a join statement will combine results from more than one table into a simple query. And again, at a high level, there are two different types of joins. Again, we're going to keep it simple in this course, but the first one is called an inner, right? We'll join two tables. In other words, the result set here would consist of records that exist in both tables. So for instance, if I did an inner join on customers and orders, I would only be able to pull in the orders from customers who placed orders. In that example, from the 89 customers, depending on my where statements. Okay. So, as a, at a high level, I might have a table of customers, right? and then they've placed orders. And so I've got A and B here. The query will result in the intersection of those two tables. Right? So think for a minute about which records would return in my data set if I did an inner join. I've got four customers on the left, one through four, and I've got only two different records in the orders table, one and two. Well, if I run that query, it's going to produce an intersection, in which case I'm only going to see sales from Joe Fabulous and Getty Lee. Right? Here's another example. I've got table A and table B, right? and I can see here in red, only the records in common are five and seven. Those are highlighted in red. And as a result, if I pulled them together, I would get a combination of five and seven. So this is how this would work. It's going to pull those. Let's take a look at our join template here. We've got select column from the first table name as an inner join with a common field name, this is important, on the primary key of the first table name, joining it on the second um, table's foreign key. All right? Now, let's see this exa an example. All right? Let's say we're doing a join on customer contact um, customer, right? We've got customer ID in both tables, so we can join from the orders table as long as that primary key from the first table equals the secondary key of the, I'm sorry, the uh, foreign key of the secondary table, All right? Let's see one of these in action. If I run this query here, it's basically the one that I mentioned, and we're going to be able to pull data from multiple tables, right? There are many instances in which case we would want to do that, right? Or how about this one? All right, we're gonna pull employee ID, employee last name and order ID, but those exist on different tables from primarily the employee table, but we're doing an inner join because order ID is on the secondary table 
order basically links through employee ID. And if I've run this query, why is this happening? I don't know why, um, that shouldn't be. Um, but I can see here that I'm pulling data from multiple tables. Must be some kind of connection issue with AWS, okay? Now, if I even get one letter wrong here, this is not going to work because there is no field here for employee D. It needs to be employee ID. I'll give you one last example here, SQL. All right, I'm gonna pull, this is a little bit more sophisticated, um, employee ID, I'm gonna use an alias here for ID, last name, and I'm gonna count orders as sales. Now, to get that information, right, order name, I'm sorry, um, employee last name is not on the order table, but I can join here because again, orders, right, has got here employee ID. Employee also has employee ID. So this query should absolutely work and it does. This tells me the total sales by representative. And so I can see here that some reps sell more than others. Okay, makes sense? Okay. Let's go back here. Again, this is just a screenshot of that view, but play around with it. It's not terribly difficult. After a while, you get used to it. Again, if you know what you're doing and you've got an ERD, right, like the one for the Northwind database, I can easily get from table A to table B, but I'm sorry, table A to table C, but I may need to go here through table B. In other words, there isn't a direct path, as you can see here, from suppliers to order details, but if I wanted to enjoy it, join product ID from the products table along with supplier ID from the suppliers table or category ID from the categories table, I can basically get across the pond as it were. I just may not be able to do it in one big step. Uh, in theory, you can join as many tables as you want. I mentioned before how in the past I've written queries that have joined seven or eight tables. Uh, for the purposes of this course, we're keeping it relatively simple. Now this is an inner join. Again, it, in an inner join, it's going to return information as long as they exist on both tables. But this begs the question, what if they don't exist on both tables? In which case, and we're really not covering this class, but I might as well mention it, um, there are different types of outer join statements. One is a left outer join, right? Returns all rows from the left table, even if no matches exist on the right. And then the other one is a left right outer join, basically the opposite, returns all records from the left table, even if there are no matches in the um, Sorry, right table. Let's see that one in action. So this is a right outer join. And if I hit query here, right, you'll see here that order ID is null. Right? These are the two customers who never placed any orders. Right? Remember I, I told you we had 91 customers and only 89 placed orders? Through an outer join in English, I'm basically saying, tell me, which customers haven't placed orders. Tell me which records are null in the orders table, right? Remember, we've got customers, 91, and they placed a bunch of orders, but this is a very simple way of determining which customers haven't placed orders. Again, I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about outer joins here, but you can absolutely do that, All right? Visually, how would this look? If I've got an inner join here, it tells me that I'm returning records as long as they're in both tables. A left outer join has got information on the left, even if it's not in the right, or it's in A, even if it's not in B, right? And a right outer join is basically the opposite. Give me the records if it's in B, even if they're not in A, return both, okay? So again, we could modify our template here. If we want to select distinct records, we can from a particular table. And then we can do an inner join on the second table as long as we're joining in the right manner, which is by using the primary key of the first table along with the foreign key of the second table. Again, as long as those values are equal, you'll be able to pull from both. And then you may want to put in a where condition. So, you know, which customers have placed orders uh, in the last six months and first names of the employees start with A or B or whatever. And then you can order it however you want. Okay, now in case you're curious, and this is a little bit advanced, can you apply, apply different types of joins in the same query? 
Uh, the short answer is yes, but you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Next up, what if you want to perform calculations on your data? I previewed this before. Remember when I asked you about the number of sales that a given employee has made? So SQL comes with a bunch of other functions that can summarize data, right? The short answer to this question is a lot. Let's start with a count statement, right? I want to count the number of records that meet a certain condition. In other words, that answer a specific query. I can do that. I can also do a sum. So let's say that we've had 10 sales, but each one was for a different amount of money. Could I figure out total sales by rep? The answer is yes. How about the maximum sale? I can do that. Minimum sale, I can do that. Or average sale, I can do that. You can also concatenate records. And okay, concatenate, I mean combine. I can put first name and last name together if I want. Right. So let's take a look at a few of these. Right. So here I'm asking in English for a sum of freight as total freight from the orders table, but only for customers that start with A. And I'm going to group this by customer ID. And now it works. Don't ask me why it didn't. So in English, for only the customers that start with A, I have summarized freight as total freight for only those that start with A. Now if I were to remove, oops, well, let's just cut it out here. Um, I were to write this query without that condition, I'm going to get total for everything here. But again, the goal of this query was to show you how I can total freight, right? Now note that you can't total names, right? I can't total dates. That doesn't make any sense. I would need to total a number field. And if I go here to the order table, right, I can see that employee ID is a number. It goes to the right. And then freight is as well, right? It is an actual number. Right? I can't total ship name. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, let's see another example of this in action. Okay. So I want to count from the employee table the number of titles. Right? So if I run this query, I'll see that I have six sales reps and one VP, one sales manager, and one sales rep here. Now, what if I did sum of title? Let's see what happens here. Okay, sum is zero, right? Doesn't make any sense. I can't summarize a title, okay? But if I switch that back to count, there you go, right? Okay, so that's uh, a little bit about functions. Again, going back to our template here, if we want, we could select uh, function, right? Say column names from the uh, column ta um, from the table and where a condition exists and we can group it if we want and order it. Okay, so again, if you forget one of these steps here, for example, let's go back to SQL for a second, right? And I, some students made this mistake in the past. If they forget to group by title, this isn't going to work, right? See here, I don't have everything here. It's just giving me a total of everything. And we know that we don't have nine sales reps. If I hit control Z and run query, the query here, you see I have six. So forgetting group here is going to return errant results. In English, just because you ask a question doesn't mean that you're going to get the right answer. Um, you have to use your brain here. Again, computer programming languages are only so smart. Okay. Now, for a count of title here, let's say I'm going to put here as job title. Okay. Let's see what happens now. Right here, I've got title, but I don't want to call it count title. This is what they call an alias. I have called this something else. Alias is quite simply a name for another field, right? Just like in real life. So again, if we go back to our template here, we've got select, let's say a column name, but we're using it as an alias, right? We're pulling it from a table. We might have a where condition. So where, you know, a function starts with A, we would potentially group it if we wanted to do a count, and we would then order it if we wanted to do that. All right, now, 
Again, this is a little advanced, but what if you had a query within another query? In other words, what if your where function wasn't where date equals to January 1st or customer name equals peart, right? What if you wanted to write a query within another query? So what if you wanted to write a query within another query, right? Let's just do a select all to clear this out. Um, employees. Okay, so these are all my employees. It's the simplest query you could write, right? But what if we want a more complex query? What if I wanted to determine the two customers who haven't placed orders? Well, I showed you before how you can accomplish that with an outer join, but here's another trick. It's a little advanced, but I think that you can handle it, right? This is a query that uses as its condition a where statement, and that where statement, again, isn't simple, where sales will equal to January 1st, or where last name equals Smith. This query is another query. Select distinct from orders. How many customers have placed orders? If I run this query, I get 89. But we know there are 91 customers because if I go to the customer table here, we've got 91. So how would I square that circle? This subquery acts as a condition. So tell me this distinct customers by company ID and company name from the customer table where the customers are not in that other statement. And if I run this, I'm going to get FISA Fabric and Paris Specialties. Those are the two customers active in our customer table who have not replaced orders because they're not in the order table. Okay? So again, that's just another tip. Right? Now, again, I've been writing queries for a long time, and you might have some tips about how to get started. So here are some rules for writing effective queries. First up, start simple. Right? As you can see, even with fairly simple select statements, you can start to add multiple tables down the road, different conditions, um, different grouping or sorting, ordering options. So I'm a big fan of starting simple. Do not try to boil the ocean. Save often, right? just like anything else. It is very simple to save, uh, whether using even a simple Google Doc or I'm a fan of a program called Atom. Also, embrace version control. Now, this is important because particularly when you start working, um, if you launch a, an application or some code and somebody modifies it, they may not tell you or you may make a mistake and want to get back. So if you've got version 2.1 of a code and you find that you made an error, you can go back to version 2.1. When I was a consultant at a hospital, I was creating a very complicated Microsoft database and without telling me one day, um, someone went into my database and made some changes. Well, I went in the next day and my database didn't work correctly and I spent two hours banging my head against the wall. Ultimately, I asked a woman next to me if anyone had gone in and she said, oh yeah, we did, why? What's up, does it not work? Um, you don't want that to happen to you. Right? So again, version control is a good thing. Also remember security. Uh, many organizations make this mistake, but if I were to write a query from a table and there's no security involved, then I would be able to access that information. And if I'm pulling information, say, from an employee table on social security number or salary or home address, that could get me in trouble. Ultimately, though, the biggest tip I have for you is to know your tables. If you know where they are and how they're related, you can basically get from point A to point F if you need to. You just might have to take a few steps in between. In the case of the Northwind database, and these are some of the most important tables here. Knowing how those tables are related, knowing which is a field's, a excuse me, a table's primary key and which is another table's foreign key are certainly important. Okay. Uh, more tips on writing queries. Embrace critical thinking, right? Why isn't your query working? Why is it returning different results? Sometimes it makes sense to step away from a query if it's hurting your brain. Uh, next up, add conditions as needed. Right? Again, this is along the same lines of starting simple, but it's not inconceivable that someone down the road will say, hey, that's a great query. Uh, can you now pull it for a different set of records? I want customers not just from the east, but from the west, or customers from one shipping method or another. Um, I'm a big fan of using comments, right? as we've talked about before, um, to explain what you've done. This makes all the sense in the world. 
right? So let's just go back to this subquery here. It's a bit of a complicated example, but um, aside from putting in things like this step um, serves, um, uh, how, about, how about this, limits my output, right? Again, this is a comment, my query will still work, right? But if someone else is looking at my output, they might say, well, why did you do it this way, right? This can be very helpful, right? Again, it's also very easy if you want to comment out certain lines of code, right? So again, this is going to treat the lines in four and, four and five as a comment, and we're gonna see 91 records. If I move this back here to where, right, and I run this, this is gonna give me an error because where without anything after it doesn't make any sense, in which case I go back here, remove that, see the colors change, and there you go, I get to. So using comments liberally makes a lot of sense for yourself and especially if other folks are looking at what you're doing. Um, you can also, as I said before, use a multiple line comment. Uh, there's no reason that you have to restrict that to one line here. And I've got a link if you want to check it out for some uh, other tips about writing queries. Okay. Last thing, uh, don't try to do everything in a single query if you can help it. Um, I remember one time on a consulting project, a friend uh, or colleague wanted my advice and I looked at his uh, query and he had so much going on it quite frankly confused me um, particularly when you start building databases and when you get to 365 uh, you will be able to build things in a more sequential or step-like manner if you'd like to see some additional resources here are some links you may want to check out for improving your SQL skills there are quite a few of them and then finally for next time we're going to do a midterm review Thanks a lot, guys, and I will see you next time.